right. Well, welcome. All right, here we go. Welcome everyone to Orange Audubon Society's bird chat for June 24th, 2021. Tonight, we're going to have announcements, plan of the week, the mystery bird, this week in Central Florida birding. We have a, that's my bird clock. I'll let my bird clock sing. And our tonight's program is going to be a really special program, something good for you to think about and start planning and maybe doing during these summer months. It's going to be a program about bringing birds to your yard. Um, there are no bird chats until July. We're taking a little hiatus. Our next bird chat will be August 5th. It will be Rafael Galvez, um, Florida Keys Hawk Watch, which will be really exciting. Okay. okay. Here's, here is a exciting announcement that I just saw today that the Merlin I, uh, app that's put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is a free app for bird ID. It's my, I recommend it highly. Now it has uh, a feature to help you identify sounds. So we've been waiting a long time for that. So do check it out. If you have the app, just do an update. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah Green for Plan of the Week. Thanks. Okay, since I did giant bull rush recently and I was out on the Lake Popka Wildlife Drive lakeside and, and noticed that they have sawgrass and the uh, inflorescence are very similar, I thought I should profile sawgrass. Um, they're both in the same family, the Cyperaceae sedge family. Next slide. Oops, sorry. And sawgrass, like its name says, uh, has these serrations on the edge of the leaf and on the bottom of the leaf, such that if you have to hike through it, um, it's quite, it could cut, your, cut you up. <laughs> And um, here to compare it with the bulrush that it has the rounded uh, uh, leaves, leaves, stems, um, stems. Those are the, not the leaves, they're the stems. Okay, and here's the distribution of the sawgrass throughout the Southern United States. And then next, I wanna show what it looks like in the Everglades and that it's the grass of which the name river of grass is named. It, it, it likes a sheet flow. It likes low nutrient water, limestone surfaces, and as compared to cattails, which grow with a lot of nutrients, um, it, 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 if you see sawgrass, you, you could tell that if there's not much nutrients going into the water. It's probably in pretty good condition. So that's sawgrass. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan and she's gonna do a mystery bird with you. Hey everybody, we're gonna kind of change it up a little bit. We have two mystery birds and we're gonna start with the mystery bird songs. So this is mystery bird number one. Very good. So now I'm going to go ahead and play mystery bird number two. Give me a second to pull it up here on my phone. And so mystery bird number two. So these are kind of similar types of birds. All right. So we're gonna look at the picture, we'll go to the next one. We do have one guess for, I'm assuming song number one, cause the guess came up after song number one. And that's what bird number one looks like. Terry Breeze says, guess is yellow-throated vireo. All right. What about song number two, Terry? Anybody else have a guess? Now I got a picture. So we kind of can see, uh, picture no one ah Mary. all right white-eyed vireo okay let's go to the next one 
So the first one was a yellow-throated vireo, and the second one is a wide-eyed vireo. And I put the sonogram up here just so you can kind of see how those songs go. And then we can go to the next one. And, and that's the two. You can see the white eye, the white eyes and the white-eyed vireo. So very good. So the first one is the yellow-throated vireo. All right, guys, pretty good. And this is the distribution. Um, you can see we, um, it does say migration, the yellow-throated, looks like it's a little higher in breeding, but I do know that we kind of have them here. White eye is here all year round. So kind of have these going. Very good. All righty, so now this week in Florida birding, um, some photos as people are doing June challenge or they're just going out and birding. So um, Rosie at Spoonville seemed to be really expanding the range a bit um, in our area. Here's a beautiful photo. I believe this is from Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive from Joseph and also from Joseph. Um, seems to be a lot of young juvenile black crown night herons, at least on the Wildlife Drive. It's a great photo there. And then Sam Mitchum, who is just amazing. Um, he has photos from this past week of a black turn that came back to the wildlife drive. It was there at the end of May and then it kind of disappeared, now it's back. And we all got to see a belted kingfisher, which was a big surprise because that's way early. And then the indigo bunting, which we've been looking for, we've heard it, but he finally got to see it up on the wire. So that's probably at the gate. And then Lori has been really cleaning it up in Seminole County. She's got a picture on the left of a, a young white-eyed vireo, some wood storks, and another uh, white-eyed vireo. So those are great photos. All right, actually we'll do this at the end, right? Wait, so let me stop sharing. So I'd like to turn it over now. We have a special guest presenter. He's from Alachua Audubon. He's a longtime resident of the Gainesville area and very, very knowledgeable about how you can improve your habitat to bring more birds to your yard and for ultimately to help birds so that they have places to find shelter, food, and water. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ron and everyone make sure you have your microphone muted and we're going to enjoy the program if you do have questions just put them in the chat and we'll um, do that at the end okay we'll have time for questions at the end well thank you kathy and i uh, appreciate uh, you uh, kathy invite me to do this program tonight for uh orange audubon and i uh, said so there's a few things i enjoy doing more than talking about birds of course <laughs> something i spend a good bit of time doing and enjoy and uh, i also want to thank all the attendees for zooming in on the presentation and uh i guess a little bit of background first i, I started birding or in 1978 i uh, bought my wife and I bought a new home and one of my colleagues at work uh, built me a, a hopper feeder bird feeder he was the first one he ever built and gave it to me and I hung it up in a tree and did like most people put you know but wild bird feed and put it in there and learning process you know there's usually about 10 percent sunflower in wild bird feed or wild bird seed and doesn't take long for the squirrels to get on there and do away with the 10% of black oil. And uh, then the way the feeder, typical feeders in those days were that the roof didn't keep water out. And first time it rained, all the seed got wet and sprouted. Then you had a big mess. And a lot of people I think get discouraged right at that point. But I kept at it and kept figuring out ways to do things. And uh, so, uh, really a big a big influence on me and the fact that I got into birding was when, when I was younger maybe like some of the other people out there I'm probably older than most of you but uh, I used to watch uh, uh, wild uh, wild America or 
yeah, anyway, but Marlon Perkins and Marty Stauffer and uh, Jacques Cousteau and all those programs got interested in conservation and wildlife. And then, uh, funny thing, I, I, I remember thinking, well, there's not much I can do about the oceans or saving the whales or anything like that because <clears throat> I'm inland here in Florida. But then, uh, just happenstance, the, I don't know if you remember the old Parade magazine. I don't know if it still exists or not. It came in uh, a Sunday paper that I've got and I had a really good article in there about North American bluebirds and how they were their population was plummeting and uh, you know it was easy to, to, to have an impact on their population by making uh, bird boxes and putting them up and I, I did that started I, I made a bluebird trail about 10 miles around the area I lived at I had 32 boxes and within a couple of years we were fledging over 100 fledgings uh, most years so it was a lot of fun a lot of work but uh, that's that's a big part of how I got going and then gradually I just started seeing more and more birds and I got more and more interested and then I uh, found a, 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 bird, a book that really helped me out it's called Backyard Bird, bird Watcher by George Harrison not the Beetle and that has all kind of information about a little bit of landscaping, but mainly about feeders and the feed and water, uh, provisions of water. And from that book, I just kind of took off from there and started doing a lot of experimentation and uh, doing things on my own. And uh, so I, I started really having some pretty good success, which means I got more and more interested and uh, started going on field trips, doing the Christmas bird count, and you know, that's sort of contagious. I met more and more people and and learned more and more stuff and and uh, shared. And for several years, well, even up until the pandemic, I always was one of the instructors for the uh, uh, Santa Fe Community College. Uh, beginning bird watching course that they offer through community ed and I love doing that been doing that for a long long time since sometime in the 80s it used to be at my house at one time and then it got moved into a field event but my priority always has been backyard birding and uh, I know my wife always tells me you, you see a wider variety of birds in your backyard than you do when you go on these field trips and I have documented 26 species of warblers in my backyard about 20 of the diff of the 26, I have pictures of them on uh, water features that I've created. So uh, I really enjoy that, uh, and it gets competitive within myself trying to get a wider and wider variety of birds all the time. Anyway, and I'll be showing you some of the methods that I use in my presentation tonight. Uh, this my whole program is like a constant desire to increase the number of birds that visit my yard, and I like to share that with other people and get them to share the hobby and interesting you know you sort of have field birders and backyard birders i'm i'm a little bit of both but i'm primarily a backyard birder uh now i'm going to mention something that before the program starts in that <clears throat> i'm not a professional photographer so some of the pictures you'll, you'll say mm, uh, a little fuzzy but i i always take my photos through my windows of course and I always leave my window screens on because it really deters birds from running into your window. And I find that to be fairly effective with cutting down on window strikes. But it does affect the pictures just a little bit. So uh, anyway, if you notice that, then that's the reason for that. So I'm going to go ahead and begin. And uh, so anyway, backyard attractions, how to attract a wide variety of bird species into your backyard. Let's see here. All right, okay, uh, went a little bit too far there. Okay, it's all about the love of feeding birds. There's uh, our backyard. That was a few years ago, so it looks a little different than that now. I'm always, it, every time see people come out here, and I do have a lot of people come out to the yard, they always say, it never looks the same. Every time we come, you've always changed some feeder or done something, that, that's just sort of my habit. This is the front yard and uh, where we live and uh, start off a little picture of some Baltimore Orioles which I've been luckily, lucky for the last, I don't know, 
six, seven years to have pretty good numbers of those coming in. The peak I've ever seen at one time was 22. This year, I average probably more like 14, 15, something like that. But uh, man, they're just so beautiful. It's it's hard to do any better than them. And uh, so I, I'm pretty happy with that. And there's three basic requirements that you need for your back backyard scape. Uh, vegetation, water, and supplemental feeding. Uh, the birds must have vegetation and cover for concealment from predators. They have to have places to, to get out of view. They also need shelter from the weather. Today was a good example of that. Birds also need the fruit, seeds, buds, and sap that are produced by the vegetation and the insects attracted to that uh, vegetation as their prime food, food source. I mean, you, there are some birds that get food in parking lots, but there's not too many. Most of them you're gonna see in some type of vegetation of some type. Birds must also have nesting sites provided by vegetation. Uh, vegetation as cover for, for protection and concealment from predators, and there's a little tufted titmouse hiding in a, in a little shrub by my place. And is, this is an example of one of the foods produced by plants. That's a, a East Platte Cahali with a cedar waxwing on it. I, I planted that tree almost specifically for that species of bird and have had pretty good luck with it recent years. I mean, I think most of you have seen cedar waxwing. It's, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful bird, hard to beat. And then vegetation for nesting sites. There's a little female cardinal in a nest built in a shrub in my backyard as well. And just to show you that, that that's very important for birds. And unlike us, birds have no buildings. Therefore, they must rely on vegetation and their feathers to block the sun, wind, rain, heat, and cold. Design your backyard habitat. Uh, first thing is plant a, wild, a wide variety of native trees, shrubs, and plants, and you will increase the variety of visitors that will come to your yard. Uh, when possible, your plant should consider the three basic requirements, vegetation, water, and supplemental feed. Plan for vegetation at each of the three forest levels. Ground level, uh, you see birds like oven birds, roof-sided towhees, thrashers, and an understory shrub level, which would be like uh, your ironwood trees or dogwoods when they used to be abundant, and all the little smaller trees that grow in the shade, and then canopy for the big tall trees uh, where a lot of warblers spend most of their time up there in the tops of the trees. So those are the three uh, different levels that birds uh, spend the time. And you, you can think about it, it's not 1,000%, but when's the last time you've seen a hummingbird on the ground walking around? You don't. I mean, they all have their different areas that they frequent and specialize in. Some are a little bit more general than others. Second requirement, water. Provide it correctly, keep it clean, and they will come. All wildlife needs moisture in some form for their survival. Some acquire their moisture from the food they eat, you know, insects and some of the different seeds or berries. But most species attain water from other sources, such as streams and rivers, lakes and ponds, puddles, leaves, uh, man-made vessels like bird baths and water features. Have you ever been in, walking in the woods and seen like a magnolia leaf turned upside down and it captured some water from a previous rain or dew? That's what I mean by leaves. And a lot of birds leave bathe in the morning when the leaves have uh, moisture on them from the dew in the morning. You'll see birds up there bathing and rubbing on the leaves and it's uh, pretty interesting. They're a very important source. And this is right in my front yard. Uh, that's a satellite dish from, I don't remember what satellite company. I found it along the road and thought, hey, that'll make a good bird bath. And I did, and the, the bluebird seemed to agree. Uh, this is one of my rock features. I, I tend to make most of my baths out of rocks that I found, find around construction sites, roads, things like that. I'm pretty fanatical about it, but I've, I'm pretty stocked up on rocks right now. But those are some goldfinches. On a winter day, if you notice, there's one dropping in from the top of the screen there. 
and they get all over that thing and fill up. But uh, that right there is where I've seen the majority, I think 16 or 17 of the warbler species I've photographed have been right there. Uh, there's another satellite dish, eastern bluebirds on it. And uh, who wouldn't want to have those in the front yard? I'm lucky to live a little bit out in the countryside, and uh, they, they are, I have three boxes up because we have five acres. You know, they usually won't get nest any closer than about 100 yards from each other, so they're pretty territorial. So we have enough area that I can have three different boxes set up, and they take advantage of all of them. And uh, so there's some bluebirds on the satellite dish. And there's what I call the Three Amigos. That was a couple years ago. Uh, three ground doves that were always together. I'm assuming it was the same three. I don't know. <laughs> I call them the Three Amigos. And you can see how close they were. They communal bathed there. And they also like the satellite dish. Uh, birds rely on available water not only for hydration, but also for daily bathing, for hygiene, parasite control, and feather maintenance through preening. Uh, clean and healthy feathers are essential to birds because the feathers are essential to the bird's mode of travel and escape. Feathers protect the birds from the elements, heat, cold, sun, rain, parasites, and predators. Feathers provide camouflage to protect the birds from predators. Feathers are used to attract potential mates and uh, they're also used to intimidate potential rivals. rivals when you think of the ruby-throated hummingbird, the way they flash the feathers on their throat. That's basically to intimidate other birds. And there's, I've been reading a lot lately where they're learning more about birds being able to see a whole different spectrum of iridescence in birds' feathers and different plants and things like that that we can't see. And uh, that's a lot of times how mates are chosen and things like that that would be not visible to us. So. All right. Uh, having a poor coat of feathers is equivalent to being homeless while driving a, an unreliable car, all while wearing worn out clothing. You think about it. I mean, that's just, they, they're in those feathers all day, every day. And let me see here. Uh, there's a little uh, viri coming in. You usually see them in the fall here, going into one of the baths. I always have a stick type of thing uh, over the bath so the birds can look at it. But birds just don't fly along and go right into a bath. They're always going to land above it or off to the side and look at it real close. And make sure that you know, everything is safe. There's no predators around or anything. So, uh, ha having a, oh, oh, went backwards, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a Cooper's Hawk on a ground bath that I have. I, I bought that from a catalog. It's made out of plastic, and it's tapered and very shallow. But that was a Cooper's Hawk, a uh, big female that came in. She you know, used to hang around in the backyard quite a bit. Hey, Ron. And, Ron, we can't, we can't see your slides advancing. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh... We can't see the slide. I know. I, how do I? Uh, I'm trying a new share here. Sorry. Stuck on the ground though. Yeah. How about that? Did you see? Did it? Did it move now? Nope. Oh. Uh, man, I'm a little stuck on this. Okay. So. Uh, oh, let's see. Maybe stop the share and restart it. Okay. Okay. Try I that. see you. Yep. <laughs> All right, then I'll go back and try it again. Yeah. Technology. It still says I'm. Oh, no, you, you're, you're on yellow-throated warbler. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's that's in another one of my rock baths. You can see. Uh, I I think to me it's it's natural i mean it, it, where do birds would see would see rocks no, uh water normally would be in some type of a rock or thing like that versus something made out of concrete or metal like my satellite bath <laughs> so uh they do like the rocks uh the water in your vessel needs to be clean uh gently sloping and shallow which means beach like because who likes to dive into the deep end of the pool when you can uh, gradually go down 
And you know, birds pick up almost 50% of their body weight when they get real wet. So that's really uh, slows them down quite a bit. And so they have to be really careful because you know, 24 hours a day, there are things one, that want to prey on birds. So they have to be pretty agile and quick. And uh, also your, your water has to be consistently available. You know, you don't go away and leave it empty for a couple of days or don't keep it clean. If, if you're consistent on, on keeping it clean and full of water, they'll, they'll learn to, to depend on it and trust it. To attract uh, the widest variety of species, the vessel container water offering must first be gently sloping, beach-like, have a maximum depth, a depth of about two and a half inches, and is best offered at both ground level and elevated. You think about it in nature, in the wild, where is water going to be primarily? On the ground or ground level. It's not, it doesn't hang up in trees too often. I won't say it is impossible, but ground level baths require cat proofing if cats are present. I'm fortunate in this area we don't have any cats that run wild, so uh, we, they're not a threat. But they can be a threat to a ground bath. There are ways to prevent them from uh, using it. I just put a little uh, piece of fence, a little field fence or anything that a cat can't fit through readily in an arc around the back of the bath so it's more than an arm's length away from the bath, the bath and the cats, if they are around, will come up and try to get through that fencing and they can't. It's very effective. Uh, dripping or flowing water will actually enhance the activity at your bath. And there's a picture of uh, one of my baths that I had. I've changed this all around now, but that was a few years ago. And uh, it's I've got a pump with a filter in it in the deep part there and where you can see the, the larger opening. And then uh, there's a little uh, rock with a, sh with a shallow depression in the, there and uh, over here and up to the left. And the birds just go crazy about that stuff. And the filter helps clean, keep the water clean. That's that uh, plastic bath I bought, I told you. I got it in a birding catalog. Pretty nice. I, I just don't use it anymore because a squirrel started chewing on it. So I've put that away for right now. Uh, there's another satellite dish I had on the ground for a while. A little female cardinal bathing in it. It works very good because it's, here again, a shallow, very slow sloping down and it doesn't get very deep. Uh, that was another iteration of my rock water feature. You can see the water spraying up in the middle. The sound really attracts attention to birds. And then I have the little pool on the left uh, by the stick. And you can see the birds, that's where I get a lot of pictures. They're laying on those sticks above the little pool there to, to see. They don't go into the big deep water. Although I did have a great blue heron hang out here for a couple weeks for a while to, trying to get my frogs. And my wife had some goldfish in there, and uh, I think a raccoon ended up getting them. But anyway, your bass will be more active if they are close to cover. If you can see right there, I'm real close to that cover, uh, which is actually a fire spike or cardinal guard. And uh, the, because as soon as they get real wet, or when they get real wet or get satisfied with bath, they want to dart over into cover. And so they go in and preen their feathers and dry off so they can gain their mobility back. Moving water will attract the attention of more birds. The sound will attract interest, and the sound inside of moving, dripping water replicates natural settings where fresh, non-stagnant water can be found. Adding a pumping system that circulates and filters your water or a constantly dripping water source both help pro produce and the, and the site and sound of a flowing, fresher, more inviting water source. Mist units are also productive, but they consume considerable amounts of water. Uh, a little advice I see all the time when well, people have a, a pedestal bird bath or whatever kind of bird bath out in the full sun. Uh, it's better if you can have a little bit of shade because think of yourself. Well, we like to take warm showers or warm baths, but birds I don't think are into that as much as we are. And I think having water a little bit cool, like here the last several weeks has been so hot and my feet, are, my bath traffic is so heavy because the birds come in there to uh, get cooled off a little bit, plus get some water to drink and, and bathe up. It's amazing how many birds come to some of my baths. 
And here's some examples. That's a little female hooded warbler I got. You can see the supply tube coming into the little putt. That's a very small little pool there, but man, the birds love that thing. And I get hooded warblers usually in the spring, male and female. Uh, that's a picture I just took recently, 61721. There's a blue grosbeak and an indigo bunny sharing a bath together. How about that? I don't think that's too bad of a, a sight. Uh, and here's some more. There's a on the top left is a prothonotory and a perula warbler sharing a bath. Then a prairie warbler on the top right, and then a yellow warbler all on the same bath. Uh, so I'm pretty pretty satisfied with the variety of birds I get, and they the majority of them, as far as species count, comes in for the bath. Uh, there's another one. There's a catbird, a cardinal, and a painted bunny all bathing at the same time, same bath. Uh, so the third requirement is supplemental feeding. Uh, there's an Oriole. The only a very small percentage of the total number of North American bird spe species will frequent a seed feeder. Therefore, provision of water and vegetation are the key to attracting the widest variety of species into your habit habitat. Excuse me. And this was taken several years ago when I first started getting orals. I was so excited that I made that feeder there out of one of these sprinklers. You see, they're, they're copper and they spin around within themselves. And I stopped spinning around, so I said, I can use that for something else. And I created uh, two uh, copper oral feeders, and they took right to them. And I replaced this vial here where I keep the uh, Jill, I got a better better deal for that, but anyway, uh, I ha I've been featured in the Gainesville Sun a couple times, and the one time they called me the MacGyver of bird feeding, because I had so many things I had cre created out of other things, or repurposed, I think the guy called them. And supplemental feeding is used to increase the variety and frequency of species attracted to your art. Feed them in the form of seeds, suet mixture or suet cakes, nectar for hummingbirds, insects such as mealworms, grape jelly and oranges for orioles, and even baked goods, which is something I learned in a book years ago that a lot of birds will like uh, pie crust, uh, donuts, cake, all kinds of different things. At one time, I was, for 13 years, I was a food service salesman, and I had a bakery that was a local bakery was my customer. And I, I was looking for some baked goods, and I said, the guy's name was Rex. I said, Rex, uh, if you ever get any day-old or spare donuts, you know, that you're not going to sell, can you save them for me? And he said, yeah. And the next time I come back, he had a, a sugar bag that I think was a, made for 80 pounds of sugar. Sugar comes in huge, big bags, and it was stuffed full of danishes and donuts and all this stuff. And I went home and made a big basket out of hardware cloth and I put all this stuff in there a lot of it and man the birds went wild for it and I still use that to a lesser extent I'll show you an example here a little bit later that's a picture in my backyard a few years ago uh, on the left is a suet log you can just barely see a little downy woodpecker on the the bottom that he's just about out of the frame and there's a bunch of gold finches which we usually have quite a few of here and chipping sparrows on the platform feeder a house finch and a cardinal, probably some other stuff there if we could look. But uh, the, during the winter time, backyard is like a traffic jam. It's just loaded because you get the the flocks of the chipping sparrows and goldfinches come in. So with the addition of uh, proper supplemental feeding, you can attract some uncommon feeder visitors. Rosebreasted grosbeaks, they're they're a hit and miss. They migrate through this area usually don't always stop sometimes they do and spend a couple days sometimes not cat birds become feeder birds after a while they i know they prefer fruit and real wild tangles but for some reason they always come in and uh, go on my feeders and they like the suet and they seem to eat, find some stuff amongst the seed too uh, there's a blue gross beak and uh, it's in the backyard uh, the yellow-throated warbler, and in the wintertime, they're a pretty frequent feeder bird, too. <clears throat> that one was eating millet, uh, white proso millet, for some reason, and did it, you know, quite regularly. And even this year, I had a, another one that was doing the same thing, not as consistent as this bird, but they definitely will go to uh, uh, suet mixtures. I, I, 
highly recommend using that. I, I, matter of fact, I make my own blend and I buy one too. Uh, there's a little dark eyed Junko. Those are getting kind of rare here. They used to be pretty common in the winter time in North Florida back in the 70s and early 80s, but they're really a rare treat when they come in now. That was about five years ago in my backyard. There was some males and females in a little flock. That's the bird everybody refers to as a snowbird. And there's a little pine warbler on, uh, he was eating, I had some strawberries I ate and I took the part where the leaf is and a little bit of fruit that was left, I put it in that little cup there and the pine warblers who usually come in to get uh, suet took to those strawberries and really liked those. Uh, that's a field sparrow. That's something I pride myself on is attracting a wide range of sparrows that normally would not come to a feeder. That's a field sparrow. Bad picture. It's a little pale. I apologize. But I was thrilled to have them. That bird stayed around about three weeks and I was so excited. Uh, and there's a savannah sparrow. Another bird you see out on like the wildlife drives and golf courses and things like that, but very, not very often in backyards. Another bird that excited me pretty good. And he was would come in feed underneath a feeder. Uh, anyway, there are many types of bird feed available. You will find blends of seed with various names. These blends will contain sun, a small amount of sunflower usually, various types and colors of millet, and a variety of filler seeds. Some are good, some are bad, and most are worthless. The greater the percentage of black oil sunflower in the blend, the greater the variety of birds you attract. However, the cost will increase as the amount of sunflower increases. Some seed types also available are white proso millet, which is second only to sunflower. Sparrows, towies, bunnings, all love that white millet proso. It, Niger, in the wintertime for gold finches, purple finches, pine siskins, which we've had a couple fairly good years for those here recently. <clears throat> pine siskins uh, feed real heavy on the thistle. For just a brief period of time, it's funny, even, even the goldfinches are, there's one period of time where they really feed on it heavier and then it kind of tapers off. It does not keep from year to year. If you have any uh, niger seed or thistle from the year prior, you might as well trash it because they won't, they really won't relish it very much. Safflower for mostly cardinals, not taken by squirrels supposedly, I couldn't prove it, but uh, cardinals will take safflower. Cracked corn, it's inexpensive, inexpensive, but attracts some less desirable species like grackles, starlings, house sparrows, and is often used as a filler seed. I'm not saying don't use cracked corn, but I think you're better off if you just keep it by itself and throw it down around brush piles and things like that. I call throw down feed, and that's where some of the sparrows and things like that. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to have white throated sparrows in our backyard, which is another sparrow pretty hard to get. That they, they like. Uh, white proso millet or cracked corn are both scattered on the ground around brush piles and tangles particularly. There's the black oil sunflower for those who haven't seen it before in the left side and then the white proso millet is on the right. Proso millet when I started feeding it in probably the early to mid 80s was $19 for 50 pound bag for years years and years and one day I walked into the the feed store where I buy it, and I ordered a bag, and he said forty-two fifty. <laughs> I said, Whoa! Couldn't believe it, and it's still very expensive, and I, I don't know why, but I tell you, the birds really love it. If you love towies and bunnings and things like that, it's a must-have, and it mixes well. You can use them separate. I usually have separate uh, millet and uh, sunflower feeds, and I also have platforms with the mixture of it. And another thing I like to say. Uh, back when I first started, there were no really good blends of seed available in the store. They were mostly pretty junky. Today, there's myriads of really good bird seed blends out there. Uh, things have changed. Just like binoculars used to be hard to get different types and, and qualities. Now, there's all kind of different binoculars. The same way seed has come a long way too, and feeders. Uh, basic feeder types. There's a little goldfinch there, probably in uh, 
early April or so when they're pretty much turned into their breeding plumage. That's one of those squirrel flipper feeders. If you ever had one of those, they're a lot of fun. That one there, eventually it broke and doesn't flip anymore, but the squirrels haven't figured that out. But when the squirrel jumps on there, it spins around real fast and it flips the squirrels off and it's really kind of funny to watch. It doesn't hurt them. Uh, this is a, a friend of mine built this platform feeder for me. It has a bottom made of uh, screen. Uh, it happens to be brass screen, which it lasts forever. So the water that gets in there will go right through and the seed can dry without glomming up and spoiling. A little bit of water does. And that's a salad bowl that I made uh, into a roof. A friend of mine gave me that salad bowl. He didn't want it anymore. I saw it out in his recycle. I said, hey man, can I have that? And I create, turned it into a roof uh, for my feeder. I don't really like water getting on my food. I'm pretty anal about that. And I usually have provisions that water won't get on there other than a really, really bad rainy day like it was here today. I'm sure everything I got outside now is wet. But I try to put it. That's an example of a hopper feeder like I told you about. If you notice, it's got that crease right in the middle where the uh, support wire that it hangs on comes, water goes right through there. And whatever's in there, whatever seeds in there between those glass panels gets wet and just turns to sprouts. And it's not very desirable. Uh, there's a classic hanging tube feeder. Don't have any seed in it. Just I just put that up there for display. Those are really, really good feeders. And there's a myriad of different ones like that, but the same basic design. Uh, goldfinches, siskins, purple finches, any of those big flock, flocking birds that we get in the wintertime, that's, that's what they're going to go to right there. And uh, I, I, I like to have usually one with black oil in it in the shell. I might have black oil hearts in another one and proso millet in another one. And the birds seem to separate themselves. I notice now in the stores they have them where they have a squirrel cage built around them so the squirrels can't get in there. And I think that's a good idea. But I don't let squirrels on any of my features. And there are ways to prevent them. You have to know the heights about five, five and a half feet above the ground minimum for any of your feeders. Like the bottom tray on that feeder would have to be about five and a half feet off the ground. Or they can jump up and catch on to it. It has to be about five or six feet away from the nearest jumping off point, too, uh, because they can leap to the side quite a bit. But I don't let squirrels on any of my feeders because I, I just, it's, it's an affront to me. Feeder placement considerations. Visibility. Uh, first of all, ease of observation by you. I, I, I don't want any feeders that I can't see out my windows where I typically sit, you know. I do it for my pleasure and to help the birds and I, I want to see where the money I put out there goes and I want to see who's coming in to take advantage of it. Uh, proximity to cover helps. Here again, you have to be about five, five and a half feet away from shrubs with heavy branches on it, but you still have to be fairly close to cover because when the hawks or whatever comes in or you go to walk through the yard, the birds are going to dive over into the shrubs or trees to get out of the way. Uh, window strikes. If you have a feeder real close to a window, birds are not likely to hit the window. But if you have it about six, eight, ten feet away and a hawk comes through there, a lot of times you're going to get window strikes. So it's either got to be maybe 15, 20 feet away from a window or very close to a window. Uh, I mentioned earlier squirrel jumping distance and ease of refilling is also a consideration. I don't want anything that's too hard to refill because when you get a lot of birds, you will be refilling pretty regularly. And here's some more foods I suggest to offer. <clears throat> suet and suet mixtures. To attract the attention and customers, place some of an on, on the corner of an established feeder for the quickest way for your birds that are using your feeders to get used to it. Is what I'm saying, if you bought your first suet cake or made your first batch homemade, put it on the corner of a platform feeder where you usually get a lot of traffic and the birds will notice it a lot quicker. Uh, place it on a suet log. Whoop. Uh, commercial cage suit type suet feeders are pretty good as long as the raccoons can't get to them because they'll carry them off. And uh, tree snags or branches smeared on the bark. Uh, there's a commercial suet cake. Not, I don't sponsor any brand, but I do like the no-melt peanut type. They're 
several brands that make that. And this on the right is the mixture that I make. It's roughly 35% shortening or lard, 4% peanut butter, and 62% cornmeal. You just put in a microwave, melt your shortening till it gets liquid. Put in a little bit of peanut butter. If you put too much peanut butter, squirrels will start going after it. They typically ignore it. And then add your cornmeal in. Keep adding the cornmeal until it gets hard. You can see how lumpy that mixture there is. And when it starts forming balls that you can form your hand and it will stick together, that's when it's ready to go. And birds absolutely love that stuff. Uh, there's a suet log that I made years ago. And uh, you can see the suet in it. A lot of birds really like that. Uh, there's a commercial suet cage on a platform feeder. Uh, one of my favorite f photographs, we have redhead woodpeckers off and on in our neighborhood. And I said, man, I just wish I could attract them over onto one of my feeders. I had seen pictures of them on feeders and in books. And it, boom, about uh, a year or so later, I looked out and there was that thing. I was so excited. I always have a camera right by my chair, as you can tell, to get these pictures. But crows eventually got wise of that and started coming in. So I can't use that anymore. Uh, but I, I love that shot, and uh, I love those birds. Okay, baked goods for birds. Those are white powdered donuts, or that is a white powdered donut. That's an orange crown warbler. They absolutely love baked goods, and these white powdered donuts are probably their all-time favorite. You can buy them at Publix, like for two fifty for a dozen, or I think there's a dozen in there. Just a regular little teeny white powdered donuts. Birds love those things. And uh, in the winter, I don't use them in the summer when it rains a lot, but in the winter when it's not raining, they're ideal. And you can crumble them up and put them in a cup or something like that. Or put them, That's a stump that I have in my backyard that I planted an upside-down dead pine tree stump, and, and I put stuff on it, and that's a big hit there. I've had, had two or three of them up there, Orange Crown Warblers, fighting over that stuff. Effective squirrel and raccoon-resistant feeders. Uh, first of all, see the bottom here with this uh, uh, camouflage covered type thing. That's a piece of 6-inch PVC sewer pipe. It can be any 6-inch PVC pipe for fresh water. Either one doesn't matter. Put some teacup eyes on the top with screen hooks coming down from the feeder to support it. And the squirrels will go up to it. They can't really get their arms around 6 inch, 8 inches better. But when it moves, because it just hangs there on those two hooks, it scares them, and they can't get going because the angle changes, and that'll keep squirrels totally off a platform feeder. Just just need to find your piece of PVC pipe, cut it to length. It probably should be, uh, wouldn't hurt to have it. Um, you're frozen, Ron. You're frozen. I don't know. We lost connection. Or is this me? Um, no, I see it frozen as well. Oh, okay. Yes, frozen. All right. Let me send him a message. Everybody will just stand by here real quick and try to get back on. It's those afternoon storms. Yeah, he was saying that there were some bad ones up there. Oh, he's calling me. Hang on, let me mute myself. That's a pretty fantastic setup he's got there. We see a lot of questions about the uh, baked goods that they're bad. For, could they be bad for birds? So we'll make sure he answers that when he gets back on. Okay, so Ron is going to try to join us again. He just lost power for a moment. Um, I can put on the end of our thing where we had information about, let me get this, about things you can do over the summer. Let me find our slides. Uh, let's see. I'm having technical issues. That should be there it. There it is. Hang on. There we go. You see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, <clears throat> here's some things that we came up with um, to do to beat the heat in the summer. 
Uh, catch up on some great reads. There's some great books. Um, David Sibley's What It's Like to Be a Bird is a very new book and I've heard great reviews and I put that on my list too. Um, Deborah, what's the new Doug Tallamy book? Um, Nature's Best Hope. Okay, there's another good one. Um, make a plan to bring more birds to your yard. Um, we got these wonderful rains and so I'm so happy I planted things about two weeks ago and they're just doing really well. Um, oh, you guys let me know when he comes in, okay? Um, check out our Orange Audubon Society YouTube channel. We have some awesome programs on there. You can watch any of them. Um, the Doug Tallamy, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that if you've not seen it. Um, make popcorn and watch The Big Year with Jack Black and Steve Martin. That's a really fun bird bit, uh, birding video. Or Dave Attenborough's A Life of Birds. Learn some bird songs, download an app, buy a CD, take a Cornell Bird Academy course. And there's even a game you can play on your phone called LarkWire that you can learn sounds. Deep clean your gear and determine if any needs need to be serviced or replaced. So yeah, get ready for fall warbler Yeah, summer. yeah. Do you wanna add anything to that, Susan? No, I just, you know. Good, good list. Uh, anybody want to suggest any other uh, birding movies? How about we um, did have Anne comment on saying that she read the Sibley book and she said it was excellent. Actually, oh. maybe that was James. I'm sorry. Okay, cool. Um, how about the penguin? March of the penguins. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, please, yeah. yeah. Pale male. Uh, what other bird? Oh, there's something about where those kids find the Labrador duck. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot the name of that movie. Yeah. Um, Sheila recommends a brome squirrel poo feeder. They have good customer service in it. So we're always looking for things to deter squirrels. Brome. Yeah, okay. yeah. B-R-O-M-E. Yeah. And it's in the chat um, if you guys want to see that. Um, yeah, and I can't, like I said, recommend more highly our, all of our bird chats and our regular programs from last year have all been recorded and just something you can do while we're on our hiatus. Mm -hmm. And I don't see him entering yet, but we'll, we'll stay on for a bit. Um, that sounds good. Cuba's Wild Revolution, Annie or James. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, somebody, Lori had mentioned Wild Birds Unlimited. I'll have to say, I have the squirrel proofer, squirrel proofer, and it works fabulous. I just have to say that I'm thankful that I didn't need to buy the bigger one <laughs> or raccoon. <laughs> so far, I've been good with just the squirrel proofer. Yes. Oh, and Anne recommends Cuba's Wild Revolution as a, a PBS special. I know PBS had one. I can't remember. I think it was called Florida Wild. It was on their nature series. And that was all about Florida. Really well done. And you can find that on the internet too. If you go just to PBS nature, they have really good nature videos. And Emily suggested the Central Park effect about the birders in Central Park. I think I did see that mentioned this morning. I haven't seen that yet. And there's one about the parrots in San Francisco. I forget the name. It's very mm -hmm. good. And there's a Juanita said novel migrations by Charlotte McConaughey. Mm -hmm. So these are, I'm making a list here. Yeah. This is a good time to read. So birding is still okay if you go early in the morning. Definitely, you know, we can see our summer breeders and see the young birds and everything. And it won't be long where migration will be starting back. Yeah, I think we're already seeing cat birds and, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And so. Ron's wife says he's trying to sign in. So if, if you want to hang out, we'll, we'll keep this going because we definitely would like to see the rest of his program. Um, this is very interesting and inspiring. I know it makes me want to even do more in my house. Makes me want to go out and find a satellite dish. 
I know, um, yeah. it rocks. You oh, back? Yep. All right, yeah. I'm going to stop sharing then. Oh, Ron, can we ask you about um, baked goods? People sure. commenting that they heard that that was bad for birds, bread and all. So how does that work? I don't, I don't use bread. It, it, it use, mainly I'm using the donuts now, but I, pie crust, a lot of things work. Uh, you know, I'm not, not a dietitian or, or anything I get, so I, I, I can't uh, claim. But I, I will say this, that, uh, say, you know, birds keep coming back every year. And, like, I don't know how many people out there have orange crown whirlers in their yard every year. I'm assuming that if it was that bad for them, I wouldn't see birds. And they know right what to do with it, right to go, right to go for it. So, I mean, that's... You know, I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but uh, yeah. I've had people challenge me on these things about jelly and all kind of different things. And uh, but like I say, if I keep getting more and more orals every year, it doesn't seem to be hurting them too bad. Or for that matter, the the baked goods. I mean, uh, I I don't know what else I can say beside that. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll finish. And while you're getting it up and running, um, Juanita was wondering how many different bird species you recorded in your yard. Uh, let me see here. I, I haven't checked lately, but I, it's right around 200. I know that. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> it's real close. I, I think it's in the 190, high 190s, I believe. But I, I'll have to check my eBird and add it up again. So. So all right, so you all you can see me, correct? Yes. Okay. And see here, get that out of the way. Okay. All right, and I've got all kinds of screens up here. Sorry. Uh, and now I need to go back to where I was. Oh man. I, I was so worried about this happening. Well, let's okay, great. Story quick. <laughs> Thanks everyone for sticking with us. We have a yeah. really good number of people on tonight, 47 right now, and it was up to 53, but thanks for sticking with us. Yes. Oh uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit difficulty getting myself back exactly where I want to be. I think I need my technical advisor to come help me. That's my wife. Uh, I think <clears throat> where's your program? It's on. I mean, yeah, there you go. Okay, all right, here we go. Sorry, you're yeah, fine. We appreciate that. All right, get back down to where we were. But uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't have a better answer for you than that. I, all I can say is it seems to, the birds seem to approve of it. I just looked it up. I'll and and I, re I remember, you know, reading in a magazine, probably some of the same people read the same thing about feeding suet to birds that, you, that they had uh, downy woodpeckers that came in and would get their feathers greasy from the suet. I've got downy woodpeckers in my house, in my feeders, all day, pretty much every day. I have never, never seen one with greasy feathers. They bring in their young. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, maybe I, doesn't seem to hit me the same way it does some other people, I guess. All right, so there's that. It talked about the squirrel flipper, and those are a lot of fun. I think they cost about $100 if you're willing to go that far. That's a gravity uh restrictor there people the, with the with birds anything heavier than a bird lands on that bar in front there the perch and the cover goes down and no one can get to the seed squirrels sometimes will hang on the top and and so and and reach down and scoop some seed out but it doesn't that's not a major problem and this is something i don't know if you've ever noticed uh sort of like maybe some of the people that uh, are a little bit older, remember when people used to build sh shelves for their apartments with concrete blocks and boards, wood boards. This is what they use now in 
like uh, their cages uh, that you put together in three sided cages and you can put your stuff in there and uh, you know for build shelves in your house well I, I figured man I could make that into a, a protector for a feeder and I just take an, an, an extra piece they come I think there's five or six cubes in a box for like 15 bucks and then I just take the extra cube and attach it to the three sided cube and there you go. No one can get in there and, and get that. It protects. You can see those are chipping sparrows there. They like to use that straight uh, proso millet in there. And uh, it keeps the hawks and, and squirrels, everything off. Uh, there's a plexiglass squirrel dome there. I bought that many, many years ago. And it keeps squirrels off. On those domes or baffles like that, it has to be about three or four inches wider than the widest part of your feeder or they'll come down there and slide off that dome and as they fall by they'll reach out with their little three inch arm and grab your feeder and stay so remember if you're going to use a dome like that which are effective you have to have a, a, a much narrower feeder uh, than you do dome let's see here okay there's uh, another one. A friend and I were driving around town one day and someone had thrown out uh, uh, like a tower thing that you'd put charcoal in and put lighter in the bottom and light it up and this little roof was on the top. It was laying beside the road and I said, stop, stop, or he said stop. One of us noticed it. Got out and confiscated it and took it home and made it into a squirrel baffle. It's very effective. Also keeps the rain off the feeders. Uh, nectar feeding for hummingbirds and Orioles. Uh, there's a uh, that's a Clearodendron Java plant that I got years ago. Good plant. Hummingbirds love it. Little ru juvenile ruby-throated hummingbird on it. Uh, you can use these window feeders with suction cups. That's one I I have. I haven't had that up the last couple of years. And here's the kind of feeder I really like because they're so easy to clean. You just pop that lid off there. And I've been since uh, 2011, every year, uh, but this year is the first year I failed, uh, we banded Rufus hummingbirds in my backyard with Fred Bassett comes from the Hummingbird Research Group. Starting in 2011 or 2012, he came. Fred Dietrich from Tallahassee was the first bander to come here, but Fred comes every year in January. And sometimes we've got as many as two. I had a friend, uh, I have a friend who had got three banded at his house in Alachua this year so uh, a little bit of an off year and uh, a new lady moved in across the street from me also got in feeding birds and she shares a lot of stuff with me and Fred left my house this year and every pretty much every year and goes over to her house right across the street and he captured a ruby throated humming that was banded here six years ago in my backyard so it's that's really fun uh, if, if you can attract the you know hum, wintering hummingbirds in there, and I don't care how cold it is, they still come. They still come in. So there's a combination. There's some fire spike, a cardinal guard, and that uh, clarodendron Java, not pagoda Java. Uh, Hummers also relish nectar made of roughly four parts of water and one part of sugar, served in a Hummer feeder. Nectar should be changed twice a week during the hot days of summer. And it has to be should be served in the shade. Can you imagine going up and sipping hot nectar water out of a feeder? Wouldn't you be more likely to go something that was in the cool of the shade? Refrigerate during storage up to two weeks. Uh, yeah, Orioles and other birds like grape jelly, halved oranges, grape grapes, apples. Hang up, hang a bunch of grapes out on your feeder if you want to get some action out of Orioles. They love grapes. Peanuts, shell pe shell in shell peanuts, blue jays and titmoss particularly, and suet mixtures. Uh, there's a couple Orioles coming in. Uh, let's see here. Insects is bird food. That's dried mealworms. I, I've been using those pretty much lately. I haven't had too much luck with the bluebirds, but uh, Carolina wrens and uh, house wrens really seem to relish them. And, and I, other birds go to it too, but not like the wrens. Uh, nesting cavities and bird boxes, 
and, uh, and also dead trees and snags. The chainsaw is probably the worst thing ever developed for cavity nesting birds particularly because as soon as a tree dies in people's yards they cut them down because they're afraid of them and I understand that but it really has decimated the cavity nesting bird population so we have to replace that with boxes and it works real good as a pair of bluebirds there's uh, some chickadees that took up a nest in one of my bluebird boxes if you notice the green on the bottom you can always tell if it's a chickadee nest if it has about an inch and a half of green moss on the bottom and then some fine hair or thing uh, wrapped around in a circle and actually when they leave the nest a lot of times they'll actually cover up their babies with some of the the string and moss it's really kind of interesting it's pretty good protection uh, it's funny I my wife has horses so when she sh uh, shaves the horses uh, periodically. I collect the fur and put it out in uh, feed and suet uh, feeder type things and the little tit mice and chickadees and great crested flycatchers come in and grab huge mounds of that horse hair, <laughs> fly off and put it in their nest and come back over and over again. It's really kind of funny. Neat way to attract birds right to your house that you normally wouldn't get that lucky to. There's a dead tree in our backyard. I think it's since gone. A redhead woodpecker on it. Pele to get ready to go in a bath. That's on my little stump in the backyard there. That's a treat to have them. They don't bathe very often in a bath, but every now and then they will. It helps to have something that they can hitch down right to the edge of the bath and go into. Red belly woodpeckers are plentiful. I got a bunch of them. Uh, other guests to expect. Squirrels, of course. Problem child number one. Possums, raccoons, they can be a real problem too. Uh, eight inch PVC pipe as, as a baffle coming up the ground so, and mounting your platform feeder or whatever on that will keep squirrels, uh, raccoons off. They can't get around eight inch. And then you got your Cooper's hawks and sharp shin hawks in the, the uh, winter time. Here are just some other birds that I've photographed. There's a downy on a suet cage. Cardinal taking a sun bath. Cat birds, pretty good feeder traffic. Bluebirds bathing again, R rose breasted grosbeaks, thrashers, red bellies again, blue grosbeaks, blue jays, goldfinches, summer tanager, female, cardinals, pine warblers. Pine warblers are the most variable of all the warblers, as far as they can go from a total dark gray or drab gray to very bright yellow. And there's a robin. There's a couple of yellow rumped warblers and a bunch of goldfinches taking a bath. So I know I'm getting to the end of the time period here, so I'll go ahead and open up to the questions in the Christine, chat section. Christine did have a question. Do you find that your feeders attract mice and rats? Uh, you know what? I, I, mice I've never had. Uh, in my other property where I lived, every now and then I would get what's called a hispid cotton rat. They have a very short tail, they're a native species, not a problem. Uh, they tend to live in brush piles, but no, I, I can't say that's ever been a problem, really. I've heard other people say that they've had that issue, but I never have. Now, Jerry was also wanting to know about that one that you showed the picture with the PVC pipe. I wanted to know how long yeah. that is. Uh, Probably 24 to 36 inches long. You know, if you get a short blood time, they'll cut it off for their use and then just throw it aside. You just have to kind of scrounge around big construction or road sites and see it. Or you can actually buy them at, at uh, commercial plumbing stores and have them maybe cut it for you. It's it's a little challenging to cut, but it's, it's way worth it because they cannot defeat it. I use it uh, as an all-around, just say if you're... Uh, feeders mounted on a four by four pole. Well, just have a, a piece that's cut to the height of your, to the bottom of your uh, uh, feeder, to the platform feeder, and they can't, they can't get up. It's better if it moves. That's why it's good to hang it. But even if it's solid, you'll see them jump and they just can't get their arms around it. Picture, you know, picture yourself trying to get something, your arms around something that was too wide. Okay. And then Sheila wants to know, do you have any ideas on keeping big grackles out of the feeder? Boy, I tell you what, that's that's a problem. I know my sister-in-law lives down there in your area, and uh, she's in Osceola County, and that's a real issue for her. 
you know, the grackles only pass through this area uh, usually once in the spring, very seldom in the fall, and they'll come in for about three days, and they go through my lawn and eat all the grubs that are killing my grass, <laughs> and they'll pass out, they'll go to the feeders, but it only lasts for a couple days, and then they're gone. My biggest problem like that these days is brown-headed cowbirds. Uh, we have horses, so they like to feed around the horses, but they'll also come in, and they like white proso millet, like a lot of the other birds. So when the grack, when the brown-headed cowbirds get to be a problem, like last year before last, I had 84 in the backyard one day, and I said, okay, that's enough. So did you take the feeders down? Was that yeah, I just I took my millet down. They don't they don't really go after sunflower, <laughs> and and I I took so I just took my feeders down. But I think I kept them down for a week, about seven days, and they uh, they disappeared. For the most part, I think I got two or three out there now, and that's about it. And I, I'll I'll live with that. I can put up with that. I'm lucky enough to remember when they weren't around here. <laughs> it was really nice, and uh, I don't know uh, how many people know the story of how they got here to, uh, in this part of the country, but it's kind of interesting. There's a little plant list that I got somewhere. I don't remember uh, suggested plants, but. Uh, uh, now, Susan was wanting to know, how do you deter ants from your feeders? Ah, very good question, Susan. Thank you. But particularly with hummingbird feeders, but they can be a problem on everything else. Uh, I, You can buy it in several different stores, particularly if you have like a Wild Birds Unlimited or even Lowe's sells it. I'm not sponsoring any store. Probably Walmart has it. It's called Ant Guard. I think it's Ant Guard. It's like a clear... Uh, lick, not liquid, jelly type thing, clear jelly, and it's you just put very little bit on the uh, re, the point where you, the restricted the ants are restricted to one thing. In other words, like the hook that's hanging down to hold your feeder up, your jelly feeder or your uh, nectar feeder. You know what I'm saying? Where you just have one little thin piece of wire or whatever it is. You have to get to one point where the ants are forced to go one place and just put a little coat of that on there. It lasts about six months. It'll turn green, and for the most part, they will not cross it. I think it costs about $8 a tube or something like that. that maybe two tubes in a pack. I don't remember. But it's very, very effective. Very good. Penny wants to know what you use to clean your feeders and baths. Bleach? Yeah, yeah, I have for for the uh, platform feeders and the hanging feeders, I use a disinfectant uh, spray, pump spray, and disinfectant wipes. And uh, I, I try to, you know, get all the seed out, hose them down with a hose real good on a high pressure, and then just take the, either the spray and spray them with that. But usually I'll use the wipes because it dries a lot faster because you don't want the birds going on there when the, when the uh, solution is still wet. And uh, that that's uh, the way that I handle that. It, it works real good. Bleach, I've ruined so many pair of pants and shirts with bleach. <laughs> uh, now I soak my hummingbird feeders in uh, white bleach, uh, white, I'm sorry, vinegar. I leave them in there overnight or for a day or so. I have two of everything and I rotate them like that. And while the other one's in use, I store them in white vinegar cheap you buy it at Publix or anywhere like that just white vinegar it's very acid and you're like in effect making pickles you just have to make sure you rinse it out real good so the smell of the vinegar is still not on there but it works very good and you know I mentioned Fred Bassett the hummingbird bander before he, he's banded more than 80,000 hummingbirds and, and he he's kind of the head of the hummingbird research group now and I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of seeing him give a talk He's a dynamic speaker, and he says people are way too overwrought about sterilizing hummingbird feed. He says the first time another hummingbird comes in and puts his bill in there, his tongue, it's not sterile anymore. You know, he says use warm water, and, you know, tap warm top water or something is good enough and because it helps the sugar mount in the water. But as far as sterilizing it, that's not really totally effective. I'm not saying put dirty water out there and as soon as you see your water start discoloring you know you've waited too long it needs to be changed I try to change mine two or three times a week during the summer winter time you can let it go four or five days maybe six 
but the, since I, I've had uh, one uh, Rufus hummingbird female was uh, banded here three years in a row. Same bird came back, and she was an adult the first year she was banded. So I'm, I'm pretty pretty solid in my feelings about the birds coming back to visit me again. And uh, uh, again on the baked goods, I don't put bread out. I, I, I've read people say that that's not good, but as far as the other baked goods, if I saw that all of a sudden I wasn't getting some of these species that, that use it regularly, then I would I'd start thinking, well, maybe I've done something wrong. But until that happens, uh, I'm going to continue. Now, um, Susan also wanted to know the squirrels are chewing through her baffle. Do you have any tips for that? Yeah. Well, oh, man, Susan, I've, I've been there. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. They have ruined so many stuff of mine over the years. Uh, <clears throat> You know what? I, I don't know, Susan, if your baffle is, is a hanging that baffle over top of your feeder. If that's the case, I'm fortunate enough here to have tall trees. So I put, I take a, a heavy piece of iron pipe fitting and throw it over a branch of a tall tree as high as I can get it and then just pull chain up there, tie it off. And so the, most of my feeders that hang from trees or 15 20 feet down and they for some reason they won't go down that far and i I never have trouble with that and if you so notice that one baffle i showed was metal if i was having that trouble i would just go to all metal uh baffles and you can buy those they're not super expensive or anything or you can do like i do scrounge them somewhere <laughs> and convert something or repurpose it into a to a baffle i've also got a bunch of I, I'm a retired utility worker, and our street lights that we used to use to mount on top of a utility pole had what they called, uh, well, I won't, name might be, but some people also don't use it, but anyway, it looks like a hat uh, that maybe you would see Chinese people use in a rice pattern or something like that, big, wide, tapered uh, aluminum thing. It's, they're probably 36 inches wide nothing bothers those whatsoever they keep the rain off really good they're very wide they keep the squirrels from tipping them down and going over and i i swear you could come here and i guarantee i've had a lot of audubon groups come out here on field trip and everybody remarks is man no bird no squirrels get on any of your feeders and that's something that's very important to me i do not feed squirrels or anything like that and uh so everything i got is pretty much rain protected and definitely squirrel protected and then the last question we have from Sheila is, does it hurt to use hydrogen peroxide in bird baths to keep the algae out? You know what? I, I've never done that. I've never read anything about it. I, I can't say one way or the other, uh, Sheila. I don't know if what the effect of it would be. If it sterilizes, I, I I guess that's good, but just have to make sure you really rinse it off with, heart, you know, with a high power, you know, a, a hose on pretty good force. I would think so because it's like those disinfectant wipes now. You gotta wait till that totally dries or hose it off after a while because you don't want them, you know, getting on that stuff too much. But it, you're very correct to want to keep your feeders clean. It's very important, particularly if you get house finches. I don't know if they come down that far, but they're, they're pretty common around here now. And they have that uh, genetic deficiency and they are prone to getting foot pox and eye pox you'll see them where they'll keep one foot up they want to touch and that comes from uh them landing on areas where other birds have been that that other house finches have it and they they can spread it and uh it hasn't been a problem for me but i have i can't say totally because i did have a cardinal one time come up with a a, a sore foot uh that might have been foot pack pox i don't know they can defeat it after a while but uh, also wanted to let you know that from 2011 to 2018, yeah, uh, Smithsonian Institute came down here and banded well over 100 birds in my backyard, but they were only banding cardinals, titmice, chickadees, and Carolina wrens. They, all the 100 birds were of those four species. The, the program since lost funding has gone on, but it was a longevity study. And I have a cardinal here that I know is at least eight years old and it eats baked goods almost every day. And it's still out there and it's been there 
<laughs> for a long time. And uh, so here again, that's proof again. But I think when you find the study yielded that most birds don't live more than just about a year to a year and a half. And you can look that up. It's, it's in the, the literature. Birds don't live very long. If something gets them, uh, predators, windows, disease, or a snake, or whatever. But that, I, I feel very honored to have a, a cardinal that I know is a minimum of seven years old. Very good. Well, that, I think that's it for our questions. Okay. I really Whatever enjoyed it. Thank you. A great presentation. We really, really enjoyed it. Very informative. Okay. I did too. And uh, keep at it. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of trial and error involved. <laughs> and uh, if you, you can defeat these things, use some of those basic principles and you'll, that I've given you there and you, you'll be just fine. And I, I really appreciate the interest for all you people out there. Thank you.